Hi there, come on in. I'm Fred Trost along with Bob Garner. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things this evening. Of course, we have our standard trophy report, outdoor headlines, Bob. A recipe. A recipe, a, a good one, we hope. A good recipe, we hope. We <laughs> haven't tried this one before, but I think it's going to be great. Uh, we have some little gift ideas for sportsmen. That's mainly what we're going to talk about this evening. You know, things like this. What is it? Well, stay tuned. You'll find out. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From now, we're not going to have ideas like uh, buy a gun for a hunter or things like that. We're talking That's about a good idea, though. That is a great idea if you know which one to buy. But we'll talk about items here, gift ideas for the sportsmen that are, you know, your under $10 items. Now, here's one right here that has just been introduced to Michigan. And we've had this on the show before, but uh, a lot of people have called us and asked about these. It's called a super sling. It's made out of a, a special type of rubber that you can put on any rifle or shotgun. You've used these before in turkey hunting. I've been using them for years because I had double barrel shotguns and I used to a guide and I'd mm -hmm. uh, let people take those magnum shotguns. And it's almost impossible on a double barrel to get a sling that fits. Right. Well, these, these super slings doing the nice thing is that you can be walking through the woods and not have the weight of the gun or the coldness of the gun in your hand and you can still pull it up, you know, to get a shot. That's right. They're super. Handy That's little idea. Another thing that the same organization makes is uh, called, it's a scope cover, very inexpensive, I don't know, three, four dollar item that uh, is made out of the same material. And Fred Shear, the guy who's developed this, uh, we talked to him about this up at the outdoor fair in Houghton Lake. I've known quite a few guys that have taken an inner tube, bicycle tube, something like that, and right. made a scope cover that right. looks very similar to this. Yep, that's right. I'll tell you what's wrong with those, though, Fred. They'll work for a little while, but they're made of a butyl or a neoprene. You know, they get them from an inner tube, and the minute they get out in the cold, they break mm -hmm. and they're froze. Now this is the same same material we make the sling out of. It's an EPDM rubber. It absolutely will not break, mm -hmm. and it will last forever. It doesn't deteriorate. You know they're guaranteed. All our products are guaranteed for life. But it's very convenient to carry in your pocket when you're not you know when you're not using it. When it Just slip it off of the scope. It'll fit any scope from uh, two inches up to 14 inches, and that's what you do with it right in the pocket. Yeah. Now that is handy. Yeah. Okay, that's that's one idea. Here's another thing that can fit in your pocket that was invented by the Molesky family from down in the Taylor, Detroit area. It looks like a speedometer cable, which I think basically it is, but it's used for cleaning guns. And of course, gun cleaning kits are a good Christmas gift oh, idea. They're super, especially this one because it's got adapters, Fred. You can clean any rifle or shotgun or even a pistol with uh, with this one gun rod. See, I'm feeding the the brush around the corner from the action end. Now, what we want to do is pull the dirt from the back of the barrel, from the action, out the front. And we just pull it like this, and the dirt comes out of the front of the barrel and doesn't get deposited in the action. But this is its called a flex gun rod. It's just a rod. If you have the other components of your gun cleaning kit, you might find that that's a handy stocking stuffer for sportsmen. The other thing, and even when you're out deer hunting or whatever, you can stick that right in your back pocket, right. get snow in your gun, just take it out of your back pocket and clean it. Now here's something for hunters and shooters who don't like that recoil on their shoulder, and that includes just about everybody. This is, uh, Sam Johnson developed this from the Flint area, and you can attach it to your shoulder or your shooting jacket with Velcro, like that, and you can, uh, a number of people can use this same recoil shock eliminator as it's called. Also attach it with a safety pin, but you can pound this with your fingers, and here's what's inside. It's this jelly-like substance. It's the same stuff that they put in ejection seats and jets, you know, an aircraft, but that... It works, it works. And the pad works right. uh, just super with a shotgun. When that gun kicks on your shoulder. Now, what else do we have? Ah, for bow hunters or target shooters. Now this is sort of a, it's not a misnomer, it's called a bow scope. And this bow scope is not really an optical scope because it doesn't magnify. In fact, you can see from this end right here that it's opaque. You can't see through the bow scope at all and there are crosshairs in there. You mount it on your bow, and it replaces the sight pin. Now, the sight pin on my bow, for example, is a pin here that I line up with my eye and the string, pull it back and put it on the target, let go. With this bow scope, uh, you look through and you put the crosshairs with one eye on the target, which you're looking at with the other eye, superimpose it, and I talked with the inventor, Ron, from Florida, you know, about this. There's two main differences, Fred. One is that uh, when it gets too dark to shoot with a pin sight or a peep sight, you still have a bright set of white crosshairs on the target in the woods. The other thing, which is a real key, is that you don't have to hold your head exactly the same every time or whatever. If the game's at an awkward position to shoot in the woods, 
uh, as long as the center of the crosshair looks like it's on the game, the air is going where that center of that crosshair is. Yeah, now it's not a scope. All it is is a sighting mechanism, just like a sight pin. I think I'm going to give this a try in the next few weeks, Bob. If you're going to have to beat me to it. Okay, well, I'm going to put it on my bow right after the show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, this past deer season and pheasant season were not ranked as the greatest, Bob. But I do have some trophies from both of those seasons right now in our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Report. Anybody who got a limit of pheasants this past season deserves to be featured in the trophy report. And here are two limits sent to us by Bill Bopp from Taylor. These roosters were rousted out of the cover by his young dog, Corky. Now, they weren't wild birds. They were taken on a state recreation area in southern Michigan, but trophies nonetheless this year. And here's a story first reported by the Detroit News. 12-year-old Jim Walker, Jr., he completed hunter safety, he practiced with his bow, and he went out deer hunting for the first time on opening day, October 1st. Within 15 minutes, he had his first deer. Try to tell Jimmy this season wasn't up to snuff. And Dick Hayden, the publisher of the Straits Land Resorter, it's a weekly published at Indian River, took issue with our comments about the rather marginal deer season. Now, the Indian River buck pole held 4,621 pounds of venison by nightfall opening day. All 36 deer taken within a 20-mile radius of Indian River. That's the best opening day buck pole on record, at least in Indian River. We don't know their names, but we'll make the Indian River deer hunters, along with 12-year-old Jim Walker, our Michigan Outdoors trophy hunters of the week. Custom so you make you you have personally sewn all of this? No, I think I got my wife does that. Oh she does? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. But this is your business, your full time business? Yes right. Where do you work out of your house? Or? No, we have a store in Tecumseh, right downtown Tecumseh. Is all of this deer hide or leather? Uh, or? Well, majority of it's uh, deer skin. Uh, we mm -hmm. specialize in deer skin, but we also handle uh, cow hides and suede and things like that. This, this outfit here is a cow suede. Oh. And what about this over here? Oh, that's deer skin. It's, uh, um, it's been reversed. I got the smooth side on the inside because the hides were in poor condition. And I've been wearing this coat for about uh, 10 years now in the winter. The smooth side, you mean on... Well, it's, you won't see it, Fred, because mm -hmm. what I did is that... Uh, you have lined it. Yeah, I've lined it, see? But it's uh, that skins were in such bad condition, so I, I reversed it, you know, so that the, uh, the beds wouldn't show, you know, so I'd get some more use out of it. Where do you get the deer hides? Uh, well, most of the people that come in, they uh, bring their own, and then we uh, custom make uh, whatever they want uh, from their own hides. Uh, the deer hunters drop them off for me. Uh, I buy skins from uh, the tanneries. Uh, buy them from hunters, uh, however I can acquire them. Does somebody have to, when they bring you the hide, already tanned? Already tanned and we'll uh, make uh, coats, vests, or whatever. So they have to get it tanned before they bring it to yes. you? Yes. Well, if they don't, then I'll take it to my local taxidermist and have mm -hmm. it uh, sent out, you know, to the tanneries. And mm -hmm. Just like anybody's local taxidermist can do. So, mm -hmm. how, many, how many deer hides does it take to make a pair of gloves? Uh, a pair of gloves, you should get about uh, two or three pairs of gloves out of one skin. Mm -hmm. It depends on the, on the size of the skin. How much does it cost to have that done? Well, they run about 12 to $15, depends on the, on the style of glove that you select. Really? Out of your own deer? Right. Now, what mm -hmm. about a jacket? A jacket, that must take four deer hides? It takes about four to five. It four depends five. on the style of the... Of the, uh, of the the style of jacket that you want and the size of the hide. You know, uh, deer skins run anywhere from six to 12 square feet. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then we don't strangle them, so there's holes in them. Mm -hmm. And depending on how many and in what position it has a bearing on uh, uh, well, how, how many you need, yeah. So we really have to look at them to determine for sure. And in man size, you know, there's some guys uh, like you and me, and there's some smaller ones and bigger ones. And yeah. uh, so that all has a bearing on how much material you need. Huh, but that's interesting. Are there many other people in the state who do this type of thing? I don't know of anybody, Fred, that's doing it uh, commercially like we are. Uh, there's obviously some people in, the, in their own homes, you know, uh, uh, doing some uh, custom work for people. Uh, that's how we got started, you know. Uh, uh, people call you up and they want to know if you can do something for them, so you give it a try and it turns out and it just keeps growing and then all of a sudden you're in business, you know. Yeah. So. Chuck, good luck. That's Thank great. you. Always good to see these small Michigan businesses that uh, provide services for sportsmen they like that. They do a good job. Yeah, they do a super job in there, Yoshi. That's something to consider. Maybe there isn't time this year, but next year you could take your deer hide and have some gloves made for somebody. 
for a while. Moccasins, those are they're always great items. Get a batch of them and uh, make a coat. Speaking of deer and deer hunting, here's a magazine that I think would make a good Christmas gift for any deer hunter. And this was a little business that started in Wisconsin as Stump Sitters Organization. And uh, you'll find this advertised in other magazines where to get a hold of deer and deer hunting. It's not available on the newsstand. Also, the American Hunter put out, put out by the National Rifle Association is a great magazine. You have to be a member of NRA to get that. Okay, now here's one you can buy on the newsstand, but is a good buy for Great Lakes Fishermen. It's called Great Lakes Fisherman Magazine. A lot of Michigan authors you'll recognize in here uh, fishing year-round. Gundog Magazine, if you like to bird hunt, especially upland birds, that's one of the great magazines to get. And here's a, a favorite for us in Michigan, Michigan Fisherman Magazine, edited by Ken Darwin. He's done a terrific job with this magazine over the past few years. It's also available on the newsstand, but a subscription would be a nice Christmas gift. The Department of Natural Resources puts out one heck of a magazine called Michigan Natural Resources Magazine. In fact, every time you renew your driver's license or whatever, there's usually right. some sort of flyer in there about that. Now here's a publication that's a little different. You don't find it on too many newsstands, maybe a few up north. It's called the Northwoods Call. It's a tabloid. Uh, Glenn Shepard edits this from up in Charlevoix. And this has a lot of the hot scoop and details on outdoor headlines. And of course, these are things that you sort of hint at and develop for two minutes every Thursday night. Well, that's right. Uh, I think if a person really wants to keep up on the outdoors, if they stay tuned to this show and for some in-depth things, go to Glenn Shepard's uh, the paper Call. there. That's yeah. right. What about the outdoor headlines, Bob? Some headlines this week. The license fee increase bill we've been talking about for the last year. Department of Natural Resources, at least at this time, has given up on having that in place for this year's new licenses, the 1984 licenses. So in 1984, you'll pay roughly the same or should, should pay the same on most every license that you paid this year. And where do those license money go? Well, those license monies go to the Game and Fish Protection Fund, and there's some property that, that hunters and fishermen have bought, and the property taxes are going up at an astronomical rate. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at what we have to pay for property taxes, $4.8 million, $4,800,000. Now, that takes in, let's take a couple license categories and look at them, that would take in all of the money revenues from the small game license, the bow and arrow deer license, the sportsman's license, and the bear license. And that looks that is a lot of money. Four point eight million dollars is spent right away to local units for property taxes. That is going up, by the way, at a rate of about 10 percent per year. And Phil Wolbrink has been named as the Conservation Officer of the Year by the Shikar, uh, Shikar Safari Club International. Uh, Phil was given this award for outstanding community service and also for dedicated work as a conservation officer. And the Department of Natural Resources Natural Resources Commission could next month set up a season on lake trout. The season would begin May 1st and would end August 15th, and that season is in answer to the problem we've had with depleting lake trout stocks around the Great Lakes. And of course, as we mentioned, you'd want to keep an ear to the television set on Thursday nights. A little transition here into something. It's a uh, not really a gimmick. It does work. You've used it in the woods? It works. It works for two things. It works for gun deer hunters sitting there want to listen, you know, how many times do you hear a deer come before you see it? And uh, the other thing is it works well uh, trying to locate turkeys early in the morning, late at night during turkey season. Called the bionic ear, set of earphones with a directional microphone you can turn up and point in the woods to listen to sounds coming from a spe specific direction. This was developed by a couple folks in Wisconsin who just got an idea and I talked with them at the outdoor fair about how this was invented. We're from Wisconsin and we have a thousand acre nursery there a tree nursery. And we were having a problem with vandalism and also with deer damage. And with a thousand acres, you can't patrol the whole thing at once. So what we did is we wanted something where we could hear the deer at night because you couldn't see them. We devised a listening device, not this model, but a different one. And uh, we're able to hear the deer out in the fields doing the damage. Uh, from you that- hear them doing what? What would it sound like? Well, the, we were having a problem in the fall, uh, scraping up the trees on oh, rut. They go to the outside corners of the field to mark their territory. And uh, they'll take a $100 tree and, you know, they'll do 16 of those a night. Mm -hmm. It pays to get rid of them or to know that they're out there. Uh, with the US, or the uh, Wisconsin DNR was working with him, and they got very interested in it, and they wanted us to develop some for them, and from there it grew. Uh, that's how people get into business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the bionic ear right here, and this is a parabolic reflector that goes with it uh, to even amplify the sound more. But that's an idea that might appeal to some people, listening for deer and, and other critters in the woods in the spring. Now, speaking of these small businesses that come up with great ideas, Tim Smith from uh, Berkeley around Detroit came up with a couple first aid kits that I helped him develop. These are things specifically for sportsmen, and they come up with a pocket doctor, a camper's kit, a sportsman's, but these two little items right here really caught my eye up at the outdoor fair. Yes, bandage is a fingertip bandage, is a butterfly type of bandage. Oh, now that, that is what I've been looking for. How come I've never found one like that? Well, they have not been available on the retail market until we introduced them this past month. Oh, I see. You now, know. if you watch this, fold it around and keep the dirt out. Protective coating over the end of the finger. On a knuckle bandage. Okay. Oh, how many times do you skin your... I'm, we're going to have you all doctored up here. <laughs> Same <laughs> basic idea. Here, you, you can put that on my knuckle. Okay, fine. Now, if you were to try to do this with a plastic bandage, what would happen? Yeah, well, you're going to have... If you try to flex your finger, it'll fall right off. Okay. okay. Oh, like so. Now, you can also use that on the palm, back part mm -hmm. of your hand, any place that's movable. It's water resistant. Okay. Now this is this is what sportsmen need. Of course, Tim is a sportsman himself, a hunter, and I developed a couple first aid kits along with him. And uh, well, I, we can have information for people. I know people are going to write to us about what they see on the show tonight, so we'll be glad to answer the questions. And why don't we answer a few right now? Ed? Okay, from Marine City, here's a letter. In regards to your question, do those fishing devices shown on TV, such as fish formula, really work to attract fish to your lure? I have tried fish formula while casting at night for walleyes and have found that it has increased my catch around 5%. I have not caught many more fish, but I have caught some bigger fish. But I have had just as good luck putting a drop of an anise oil bought from my local drugstore for 79 cents. For my money, I'll stick to my drugstore and buy anise oil. Keep up your excellent show and your club digest. Yeah, well, there are a lot of these products and gimmicks to paint on your lure, mm -hmm. put on your bait, and that's uh, from Frank. That mm -hmm. was his recommendation. If you've gotten or are considering getting something like that for a sportsman friend, what about a Christmas puppy? Here you go. Your show is very interesting and informative. Keep up the good programming, and if you can, slip in some more presentations on hunting dogs. What a perfect time to talk about getting a Christmas puppy for a sportsman. Well, let's talk to somebody who knows about this very intimately, Tom Oprah outdoor writer, outdoor editor of the Detroit Free Press, and I pose that question to him. What are we going to tell people, Tom, about buying a puppy for Christmas? Your puppy's for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of a sudden there's that little hunting dog. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice? No, well, don't get a puppy just for Christmas. If you really want a puppy for, particularly a bird dog puppy, an upland puppy, breeding is all important. Who the parents are is all important. And what time of year you get it is totally unimportant, as long as you get the right dog. Mm -hmm. Too many people want to run out and get a puppy for Christmas, so they go to their local, local doggy palace. I hope I'm not impugning any, <laughs> any real business. And they buy something that says, gee, this is a purebred uh, English setter or Brittany or whatever. And it, it might be from a hunting strain. It might be from dogs that uh, were bred to hunt. But don't count on it. I think the best thing to do is uh, forget puppies for the holidays and find the right breeders and the right dogs. When the right litter's there, buy the dog and have the family prepared to bring the dog into the family at that point. Don't buy it just because it's Christmas. That's good advice. Yeah. In fact, that was substantiated by Will Schultz and other veterinarians. That's sage mm -hmm. advice from the guys who really know. Sage advice. Mm -hmm. If you have a good line on a good puppy, you're going to buy it anyway, go ahead, but not just for Christmas. Ed! Another mailbag letter? Yep. Here's one from Saginaw. Would you please send me the latest digest and let me know how I can continue to get them in the future? I hope I have all of them. I retain them in a loose leaf binder and I'm always using them to give recipes out. Okay, we have a recipe coming up in a moment which is in the digest right here. And we have, this is our sixth issue that wow. has come out. And this has been a little late, but we are now on production schedule. We'll be coming out with the 7th, the 1st of January. They were mailed out. You should have received them by now, most people, if not in the next couple of days. We sent out 16,000 of these. Uh, if you want to write to us every other month, we'll send you a free copy, or you can become a member of the Michigan Outdoors Club and have it mailed to you every other month, along with other benefits. That's all explained inside here. So write to us for a free copy. Mm -hmm. That's how that's done. You know, some other gift ideas. There are a lot of limited edition art prints, such as this one by Rob Gwynn that we have, our uh, roughed grouse, drumming roughed grouse, which is just a beautiful print, a Christmas gift idea. Uh, we have, you have the one there, the sportsman print. 
Okay. Grandpa's little angler. Right. We've done several here at Michigan Outdoors, MUCC, the DNR, the Michigan Wildlife Habitat Foundation. A number of organizations have wildlife and outdoor prints, which you can get, and they do make excellent gifts. And we'd like to feature some of the different artists that won in our competition. And especially right now, we're going to go to Dave Bowman, who did this one, Life and Times 3. And here's a cute little lab puppy probably destined to work like uh, those retrievers in the water. And Dave Bowman, let me congratulate you on this print. This Thank is you, our Sporting Dog, Michigan Outdoors Artist of the Year Sporting Dog print in 1983. Yours was selected by the public down at the Boat and Fishing Show to be the best sporting dog print in the category. It's very unusual. Well, I combine um, a little bit of my graphic knowledge and, uh, of course, the wildlife. My grandpa mm -hmm. used to go out with his lab all the time hunting, and that's how I arrived at this painting. Is that um, Grandpa there? Right. This, that's why I entitled it Life and Times 3. And, uh, of course, he, all he usually would take was a few decoys in his lab and punt up the Clinton River. And that's how he scored on a lot of greenheads. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you have the uh, greenheads in a little circle over here. Mm -hmm. Is there any significance to this design in the circle? Or well, it's, it's pleasing. It's to tie everything together, I use a design to do that. And uh, I like to work with circles. Um, Circles are something that I arrived at a few years ago, and I like to continue using mm -hmm. them in my designs, in my paintings. It's just in two colors, essentially. Right. Well, this is something of the past. It's trying to recreate something of history, and that's mm -hmm. why I didn't get into full-color uh, rendition here. You but, know. you know, most wildlife art and even sporting dog art is not the montage. It might be a head of a dog or a scene. Well, that's what I like to do. I like to tell more of a story in my paintings mm -hmm. and my drawings and that. So what, what are the people that you usually talk to about your paintings? You know, you, you have people, like we all do, where you get something done and you say, how do you like it? Well, they they'll, say? they'll uh, usually look at it and say, well, I'd like to put myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. and, that. and they'll more or less see either themselves or people who own Labradors or Retrievers or that. Uh, you know, this is pertaining to what they do also. So, I think a lot of people can relate because there's a puppy and there's an adult right. lab, the ducks. There's, there's sure. much more to look at in this. Yeah, that's why I say I like to tell a story. And, uh, of course, uh, with the remarks and that, they add a little more of a personalized touch also. Okay, this is a uh, print of one of your artist proofs that is remarked. Now, that's something extra that an artist does to personalize the print. To right. The For each individual, they all have uh, a significant idea or what they'd like mm -hmm. on their own print. And this oh, so is they ask you, somebody, whoever bought this one once? Sure, exactly. They'll, like they'll do something on, uh, you know, whether it's a duck or, mm -hmm. or another dog, a puppy, or whatnot. And you or a little out. hunting implement. Sometimes mm -hmm. I put people's, if they have a specific gun or something that they hunt with. Well, since you won, won our Sporting Dog Artist of the Year, uh, have you been commissioned more to do more dog Ah, uh, Yes, I have. I've gotten uh, quite a few commissions. And, uh, of course, well, Christmas great. time coming up, I'm doing a lot for that. Well, that's great, and, because uh, you're, just, you're, you're one of the artists who was not established who right. happened to be a winner in the right. category, and we're always glad to see that. Oh, it's been it's been fantastic ever since I won. It's been the biggest uh, super mo well, moment of my life. Congratulations really. <laughs> on that. Of course, we used some good dogs when we got these little creatures here. These are woodcock breasts that I'm cooking. This is a recipe from Don Engel. Of course, those woodcock, that was our, on our grouse hunt that we didn't get any. This, I'm going to explain how I made this woodcock cordon bleu as Bob Garner tastes it. Okay. Give it a try. <clears throat> Woodcock is not noted for its superb flavor, but is it, is it edible, number one? Fred, it's very edible. It is? Is it good? It's, it's good, and, and I'm really surprised because I've tried to cook woodcock about virtually every way possible, including the pressure cooker, and never really, never really enjoyed it at all. Okay, well, here's what I did. I took a woodcock breast and parboiled it for about 10 minutes, and then I'm taking Swiss cheese, I cut some slits into the breast and pack it with Swiss cheese, and then I took two strips of bacon and wrapped it around the woodcock breast. Like I mean, we're we're really <laughs> doing everything we can to maybe make it more palatable. See, woodcock do eat earthworms, night crawlers, primarily, and it gives them kind of a strong flavor. But this is what we did, Ed. We uh, wrapped it up like that. That's the woodcock breast, parboiled, Swiss cheese, wrapped in bacon, put in the broiler, and we. I uh, marinated a little bit, not marinated, but basted it with some dry sherry sure. wine. And you I'd said, like, you know, during the show that you had to be creative with a woodcock that's right, recipe. That you do. And this is woodcock cordon bleu. All right. Give it a try, uh -huh. Ed. I want to hear what you think about it. Mmm. It's very it, good. Mm. Is it good? The woodcock texture of the cord meat is real. Mm -hmm. Woodcock mm -hmm. cordon bleu, and that's in our issue of the Club Digest, which you'll get the, get the address right at the end of the show. And right now, Ed, why don't you give us a rundown of the coming events on the outdoor calendar? Okay, let's go to the Michigan Outdoors Outdoor Calendar. Mmm, it is good. 
I'm surprised. I'm still surprised, though. Mm -hmm. Woodcock hunters, you will not believe this, how good this recipe is. Mm -hmm. In the broiler for 10 minutes, in fact, while you were doing the outdoor calendar, Bob had to pop that other, <laughs> other one in there. <laughs> That's good. Mix it, we, make sure we have some after the show here. Mm. Boy, that is good. Get that recipe in the Club Digest. Now, some other Christmas gift ideas, as long as we're in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. What do we have, Ed? What well, you know, that? just the other day, Fred, somebody called about the fish boil kettle, mm -hmm. how, where they can get it. I'll tell you, and you, you're the one that brought this on. Uh, this is the way to do it. If you want to have that uh, salmon taste like lobster, this is the machine to do it with, right? Potatoes and onions, a mm -hmm. fish. They make the special fish boil kettles, and you can buy them in most any sporting goods store. That's right. And I'll tell you what, if you're a bow hunter, a game tracker, it's a surefire device to help find a deer that, uh, that uh, you shot, and it really helps out a lot. I used one on a bear. It worked right. uh, just fantastic. Attach one end to your arrow, the other end is on your bow, and the thread peels out so... Just like that. Just blows right out with no resistance at yeah. all. That's it's a good great. idea for, for bow hunters. Hey, this is one thing that I recommend. Uh, it's not just a stocking stuffer, it's a stocking itself. Right. But really, to keep your feet warm in winter, these wear out. Hunters, uh, ice fishermen, all need good, thick, heavy, wool, warm socks. And always a good idea for sportsmen. Mm -hmm. What you got there, Ed? Well, we've seen this before on the program. This is the Happy D Hooker. Now, you showed this at the beginning of the program. This is a great... Bob, you oh, use this quite a bit. It really works answer. on perch boats, on mm -hmm. panfish. Slip it right down yeah, the I've line. It. It's great, yeah. Yeah, you slip, your, handle slip and... your fishing line down there, run it right down to the mm -hmm. hook inside the fish's mouth, pull the trigger, and the fish will come right off. And you can be the most popular person on a perch boat. Now, there's something for the kitchen. That's right. Kay Ritchie's cookbook, uh, Savor the Wild. This has got recipes from all kinds of outdoor writers all over the United States. and. I don't know. I think it's probably one of the best ones on the market. Now, this, you may have seen these all-purpose scissors for, for sportsmen, but look, it can cut a penny. I can take a penny like this and cut it. Now, that's no big deal, but it can cut the bones on game. Poultry you know, shears poultry are fantastic. Poultry shears is great. Hey, join us next week. Have a good Christmas, once again, for Michigan Outdoors.